Italian supercars are a staple of the car world. Enthusiasts know them by name and by engine note. Even non-car people know them. I'm sure your mom, like mine, has seen a supercar and they say, ooh, is that a, a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, son? No, mom, that's a, that's a Porsche GT3 RS. It's actually the point is everyone knows these two Italian automakers and for good reason. They've both been around for generations making cars that are fast, elegant, and make great bedroom wall posters. But how do these two industry titans actually compare? Ferrari and Lamborghini are both so iconic and have such a long history of being rivals. Before Ferruccio Lamborghini started making sports cars, he was making tractors. It's only because of a disagreement between him and Enzo Ferrari that we even have Lamborghinis today. In the 70s, they battled with the Mira and the Daytona. In the late 80s and early 90s, it was the Countach and Testarossa. After combing the internet to gather as much knowledge as I could, I've broken down this rivalry down into five different categories. We are going to look at their motorsport prowess, the tech that goes into these cars, the exclusivity of each brand, their impact on road cars, and the culture around these brands and the cars themselves. With 50 years of pedigree to look at, let's get into round one. Ferrari is inseparable from motorsport. They've been racing for 90 years. That's longer than they've been making road cars. Enzo Ferrari sold production cars just so Scuderia Ferrari could afford to go racing. Unlike Enzo, Ferruccio Lamborghini wanted nothing to do with racing and said it was a drain on company resources. Despite that, Lamborghini did eventually have some direct input in F1. They supplied V12 engines to five teams in the early 90s. And out of the 80 races they were involved in, they ended up with one podium finish. Hey, that's pretty good for most teams that get involved in motorsport. I wonder if Ferrari has a much better record. Yes. <laughs> In F1 alone, they have entered nearly a thousand races, won about a quarter of those races, and podiumed over 700 times. To some, they are known simply as the Red Team. To others, they are the 16-time world champions. And to a few more, they're known as cheaters who use their money and power to influence the FIA, but that's a story for another video. F1 is not the only place that Ferrari has made an impact. They are nine-time winners of the 24 Hours of Le Mans, eight-time winners of the Mila Miglia, seven-time winners of the Targa Florio, all before the 70s. But some say Ferrari's winning days might be over. They haven't won the F1 championship since 2008, Sebring or Daytona since 1998, and Le Mans since 1965. Lamborghini is certainly late to the game. But in recent years, their motorsports division has actually made big improvement. In 2009, they started Super Trofeo, a single make series that later spawned their GT3 cars. GT3 racing is where teams can simply buy a GT spec car from a factory <coughs> for half a million dollars and jump into any GT3 eligible series with an FIA approved driver. This is where you can see Ferrari and Lamborghini on track side by side without big factory support. It may not be as glamorous or renowned as other series, but Lamborghini became a big fish in a small pond. Lamborghini customers won the Blancpain Endurance Championships in 2017 and 2019, including winning the last two 12 hours of Sebring and the last three 24 hours of Daytona. Lamborghini's footprint in GT3 is definitely growing. In 2017, there were twice as many Lamborghini customer entries in the Blancpain GT and Open GT as there were from Ferrari. While this is a good sign for Lamborghini Motorsport in the future, Lamborghini still has no plans to enter a works team into any racing series. I got a chance to speak to one of the Lamborghini representatives and they said they don't want to compete against their customers. They want to support their customers. I think that's, that's kind of cool. Ferrari is one of the most dominant and pervasive names in all of motorsport. They have been the team to beat for most of their racing career. Even if they aren't doing too hot currently, they're still the most recognized racing name in the world. Lamborghini has made it to the track, but only in recent years that they started to really progress. And even then that's with customer cars. In my book, I'm still a fan of Ferrari when it comes to the track, but there is a lot more that we have to look at. Before we move on, a big thanks to you guys for making this show possible. You guys literally shaped this show with your input. 
We're literally here every day. We're not going away. We're gonna keep on making videos for you until we work ourselves to death. Round two, technology. Lamborghini engines might be straightforward NA V10s and V12s, but they really embrace the all-wheel drive approach to supercars. Ever since the LM002, Lamborghini has been using all-wheel drive to give their cars great grip in the corners and great traction off the line. You combine that with the naturally aspirated responsive engines and a $300,000 Huracan Performante can out accelerate any Ferrari to 60. It is the fastest car to 60 ever. No, that's the... Um, that's the Porsche 918. It's the fastest non-hybrid. No, 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 that's the uh, Dodge Demon. It's the fastest naturally aspirated. No, 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 that's the Ariel Atom. It goes from zero to 60 faster than any other naturally aspirated non-hybrid with doors. Yeah. <laughs> But that's not to say that Ferrari don't work on their engines. In fact, they work on them so much that the Ferrari 458 still produces more torque per liter than any other naturally aspirated engine in the world. And on top of that, the Ferrari 812 Superfast lives up to its name by producing more horsepower than any other V12. Ferrari also started chasing hybrid power with the LaFerrari. It also uses the kinetic energy recovery system originally developed for F1 to charge the hybrid batteries using excess heat from braking. And although Lamborghini are known for their brute force ice engines, <laughs> they announced the hybrid powered Sion, which will have more horsepower than any other Lamborghini. Over 800. You know how many of those buff ponies are coming from electric power? 34. I feel like that's the most Lamborghini approach to hybrid power. Both these companies make some strong supercars and they've laid the groundwork for dozens of other supercar companies that now fill the market. Today, both Ferrari and Lamborghini are using their technical prowess and manufacturing abilities in the best way possible. They're helping fight COVID-19 in Italy and around the world. Lamborghini factories are sewing up masks, making face shields, and Ferrari are using their rapid prototyping to make respirator valves. Rivalry aside for a second, this is such a cool thing, and it makes me love these two companies even more. Round three, exclusivity. Almost anyone who buys a car from Ferrari or Lamborghini wants to know that what they have is rare. The exclusivity is a status symbol and can come from cost or limited availability. If you want a Ferrari badge for cheap, you might be able to find a Ferrari Mondial. It can be found in the US for under $40,000. It's a mid-engined four-seater. And if you get one now, probably none of the electrics will work, but you will technically own a Ferrari. There are Lamborghinis that are equally obscure and unlikely to work, but models like the Gemara and Espada are actually more valuable just for being rare and obscure. Sales and auctions of these Lamborghinis are almost double the cost of a Mondial, and at that point, you're approaching used Gallardo territory. For the average model, I mean, average as far as supercars go anyway, both companies have similar production runs. The 458 had a production run of about 15,000 and the Gallardo was about 14,000. But historically, Lamborghini has less models being produced at once than Ferrari. Currently, they produce the Huracan, the Aventador, and the Urus with a few special editions and concepts that eventually leave the factory. Ferrari, on the other hand, currently produce the Portofino, the GTC4 Lusso, the Roma, the 488, the F8 Tributo, the SF90 Stradale, and the 812. Across all models, Ferrari produced twice as many cars as Lamborghini in 2017. So far, the Lamborghini seems to be the more exclusive machine, but what about the big spenders? Just how rare and exclusive can one of these cars get? If you want the most expensive and exclusive thing that Ferrari has in their stable right now, you'll be signing the paperwork for a Ferrari FXX K Evo. After spending $2.6 million, you won't even get to leave with the car. The FXXK is a track-only version of the LaFerrari, and with only 100 in existence, this is one of the most exclusive clubs in the world. Ferrari fly these cars to tracks all around the world so owners can drive them. I was at one of these Corsa Clienti events at Laguna Seca, and it is another world entirely. There are Italian chefs and masseurs and even a few F1 cars hitting the track. And all of this 
is part of owning an FXXK. But let's say that one day you and your FXXK owning millionaire buddy are off to sell your Ferraris and get the most expensive Lamborghinis you can. You'd be walking out of the factory with one Lamborghini Veneno. Unlike the FXXK, whose original run of 40 has now expanded to 100, the Veneno was limited to three. Not 300, three. On top of that, Lamborghini is also known for some very limited run experiments, like the 20 Reventons, the 20 Sesto Elemento, and the one Egoista. But these cars, like fine wine, get more expensive with age. On the classic car side of things, Ferrari really have the value. Even though Lamborghinis have sold an auction for up to $10 million, many classic Ferraris from the 50s and 60s can double that, with the most expensive being one of the 39 remaining 250 GTOs. When the GTO hits the auction block, it can sell for $50 million. The 250 GTO is literally the most expensive car in the world. It is rare as hell. And does that make the 250 GTO exclusive? Yes, but we are trying to look at the whole brand here. And on average, it seems like Ferrari can be the cheaper option if you just want the bragging rights. Although a Gallardo sounds like it's totally worth $80,000. Round four, industry impact. Lamborghini and Ferrari had been making cars for a little while before the mid 60s, but it wasn't until then that the term supercar was in rotation and it all started with the Lamborghini Mira. It was a rival to all Ferraris, even the track spec ones. It used a sideways V12 to push itself to the then world record top speed of 171 miles per hour. But then the very next year, Ferrari took their GTB4 Daytona to 174 miles per hour. This was a very know your place kind of move, but Lamborghini did not take that lying down. The Mira was reaching its stride and the Mira S reached 179.3 miles per hour in 1969. Lamborghini held that record all throughout the 70s and it wasn't challenged until 1982 when the Lamborghini was dethroned by another Lamborghini. The Lamborghini Countach was the first ever production car to top 180 miles per hour. And boy, did it look damn good doing that. Can we, can we just take a moment to gawk at the Lamborghini Countach together? We only need the two of us together. In 1987, Ferrari released the equally gorgeous F40, which reached 199 miles per hour, but crucially never actually held the world record because by then the roof CTR had smashed the 200 mile per hour barrier. But these makers have not only fought for top speed records, they've also innovated and changed the market with their innovations. Ferrari was the first to use paddle shifters in a production car. The 355 F1 Berlinetta took its inspiration directly from Ferrari F1 cars of the time. Today, a version of this semi-automatic setup is used by almost every supercar company on the planet. Ferrari pull a lot of their road car ideas from F1, but they're not always winners. The Ferrari F50 used the V12 from Scuderia Ferrari at the time, and like F1, they made the engine structurally integral to the chassis. That is great for a race car at full throttle, but if you're in a road car idling at the light, the cockpit was like being in an Italian leather filled washing machine. Hey, is, is, that a, is that a Ferrari? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's got an F1 engine in the back. Like Ferrari's paddle shifting, Lamborghini also influenced the industry. Remember the Sesto Elemento we mentioned earlier? It's carbon fiber wheels caught on, and now you can get carbon fiber wheels on a Mustang Shelby GT500. These companies influence each other as well. The Lamborghini Urus is the company's new SUV. It's not exactly what you'd expect from Lamborghini, but it helped double their sales last year. The Urus is helping Lamborghini make supercars. And because of that, Ferrari is planning on making their own SUV in 2022. The Ferrari Pur Puro, the Ferrari Puro Sangue, Puro Sangue? I got two years to figure it out, it's fine. Do I want Ferrari to make an SUV? Not really. Is it probably gonna help them make more supercars? 
Apparently, Ferrari have certainly reached many great milestones with their road cars, and so has Lamborghini. But Ferrari's development focus has always been track first, road car second. And because of that, Lamborghini has sometimes been a bit ahead of them in the past. Round five, brand and culture. These two manufacturers are known the world over. You don't even need to own one of these cars to be part of the culture that these brands create. In this round, we're gonna look at how the brands present themselves, how the public views them, and what happens when someone takes one of these cars out of this cultural bubble. Both companies make more than just cars to hype up the brand. You can buy Lamborghini pens, Ferrari shorts, Urus branded loafers. I'm actually wearing Ferrari shoes, like right now. None of this stuff is necessary at all. It's often overpriced, cheaply made, and pandering, but it's designed to make people feel closer to the brand and build up loyalty. No car company does this like Ferrari. Ferrari is like one of the national teams of Italy. If you walk around Maranello, you'll see more Ferrari flags than you will Italian flags. Ferrari has video games, perfumes, even theme parks. No lie, my wife found a Ferrari hairdryer and she really wants one. That might be like the only way I ever get to own a Ferrari engine. So yeah, I'm, I'm down. We only need the two of us together. Ferrari has positioned itself to not just be a car brand, but a luxury lifestyle brand. And that is impressive, but it's also kind of the problem. Lamborghini somehow stays rather quiet with this. They've got their merch and their events, sure, but for the most part, they let their cars do the talking. A little while ago, Nolan did an episode of Wheelhouse talking about Ferrari sending a cease and desist letter to Dead Mouse over his nine cat wrapped 458. It was apparently viewed as problematic to the brand. Now that's not the chillest thing Ferrari have ever done, but do I have any proof that Lamborghini wouldn't do that? Well, after the cease and desist, Dead Mouse sold his 458 and put the exact same wrap on a Lamborghini. He went from his Purari to a Puracan. Now, a celebrity publicly moving from Ferrari to Lamborghini is a big marketing gift, and that might be part of why Lamborghini didn't do anything about it. But because of Lamborghini's chill attitude to this kind of thing, we end up with all kinds of ridiculous Lambos. There's Alex Choi's exoskeleton Huracan, which is polarizing to say the least. And then there's this chrome prismatic color changing one that's owned by Chris Brown. Okay, maybe I'm starting to see a bit of why Ferrari controls their brand so much. But if you're not a celebrity, maybe you don't have to worry about this kind of thing. In New Zealand, there is a salvage Ferrari 456 GT that has been engine swapped with a rotary. First off, awesome. <laughs> Second, even though stories were coming out, this guy got a cease and desist from Ferrari, it turns out he didn't. And it's not like Ferrari didn't notice. They had actually been in contact with him. Maybe Ferrari is changing. Maybe they weren't so bad to begin with. But the fact that the C&D story even got made up in the first place speaks volumes about how the world views Ferrari. When Chris from B is for Build LS swapped a salvage Huracan for last year's SEMA, again, awesome. No one assumed he would get a cease and desist. So I went into this being a diehard Ferrari fan. And I still love Ferrari, but Lamborghini's chill attitude and insane cars, well, they made me want to pick up some of those Urus loafers. For track, I would choose a Ferrari almost every time. They are designed to make you feel like a hero on track and give you a sense that you are part of that racing heritage. But on the street, the Lamborghini just gets to be more of a character. It can sit there and look pretty and refined. It can thrash around and pour smoke from all four tires. And if you wanna get serious for a minute, you can likely beat anything next to you when the light turns green. But what do you guys think? Let us know which one you like better. I'll be in the comments for the first hour this week and every week on Versus. Which one of these did you have on your bedroom wall? Should Lamborghini get back into F1? Will the Ferrari SUV be a hit? I'll see you all right here next week. Oh, you simply haven't experienced the five freeway until you've experienced it in a Ferrari. I don't know why that guy's British. He's British in my head.